Hello, I am Scott Frank, the executive producer, writer, and director of The Queen's Gambit. And welcome to our For Your Consideration panel. With me today is Bill Camp, who is one of those actors that when you tell people Bill Camp is in your show or your film, they all say, I love that guy. And Mari Heller, my old friend, director of Diary of a Teenage Girl, um, Can You Ever Forgive Me, and who played Mrs. Wheatley on our show. And Anya Taylor-Joy, who has become the face of chess, which is not such a bad thing. Carlos Rafael Rivera, a world-renowned Emmy-winning composer. And Uli Ponish. I had watched... Babylon Berlin and fell madly in love with the production design and came to see Uli. You guys have all been nominated or won a bazillion awards and that's all fine. But when we were making this, we were having so much fun. <laughs> and that's really what we were thinking about was helping each other get through it so that we could do it well and solve those problems. Um, and we never for a minute thought it would be anything other than this little show about these people that we all really cared about made with a bunch of people that we also really cared about. And when people ask, did you know, or how did you do that? Or I don't know, we all did what we normally do on every job we've ever done, you know? And so I, it's, it's strange, but how are you all feeling as this starts to sort of settle down at least a little bit? I mean, the truth is for me, I, I'm out in the country raising two kids. I'm not really that connected to the way that this show has touched everybody. Like I don't get to feel it in my day-to-day -day life. And then we do panels like this and I realize what an enormous giant hit you made, Scott. And that it's like this show has changed the world and everybody's playing chess and you can't buy a chess set online. And I'm like, oh yeah, I just think about the fun. And Bill, I remember what was so great is you were very early on in the Germany portion of the show. And I remember I felt so lucky that I had this very calm, zen-like person commanding the center of the set every day, that you were always so relaxed. And we had a young actress, Isla Johnston, who was tremendously, tremendously talented, but not with a lot of experience. And I kept telling her and her mother, you realize how lucky you are to have Bill Camp teach you how to act. <laughs> you realize how lucky you are to be in your first major role with an actor like that. And I watched you with her and I watched her learn in a way that was really great. And I watched you keep her serious and I watched you, um, you know, balance it all out for her and for me too. And it was a great thing. And, and I'm really grateful. And I'm just, Again, when we were sitting there in, in Berlin in that basement in the prison where we shot the basement. <laughs> um, <laughs> were you pretty much thinking no one's ever gonna watch this? <laughs> I had a blast, you know. I, I I think of that time, I don't know how long that was. It was I was there what, two and a half weeks maybe? I don't know. <laughs> but uh it's truly was a highlight of my entire career. I think of that in such sort of, you know, amber light. <laughs> and I was just taking the energy from you and Steve and the rest of the crew. And maybe it was good we were in a, in a basement like that. Uh, and there was something settling about it, that we were in the foundation of the building, you know, sort of creating the foundation of, of the story there in the beginning. So maybe just mise en scène, it was important that we were there. I don't know. It was amazing because it also worked out for Anya. Your first scene in Germany was the scene where you come back to the basement as an adult. And it was, I remember it was very tricky because A, you had a cold. B, the move to do it was super complicated. And you had to be incredibly emotional <laughs> in that and find a way to be, you know, without doing the other half of the scene for another two months or whatever it was. And it was your first day there. And you were still reeling from having spent the whole year doing two other movies back to back with, you know, two hours in between. So when I remember watching you come down the stairs the first time, it was, I felt really lucky because it felt like we had connected everything in this little basement early on. 
it was a really, I kind of felt the key of the whole thing. I've never worked on something that has felt so meant to be for me. Every individual player, every moment that we were on set, I just felt like this is so right. It almost, it, it didn't even, I know it was trying. I know it was a trying physical experience. I know that it was trying for all of us mentally, but it didn't feel that way. It almost felt like we were going against a current if we weren't getting swept up in it. It's like we were just all in the same river. And I look back on it as the most formative experience of my adult life and working with you specifically because you really took care of me in a different way that I hadn't experience i've worked with a lot of really wonderful people but you were very much like hey you need to be okay because i know what you're doing for this character and the character is only going to be all right if you are okay first and after having worked in such an extreme way that level of love truth be told was just something that i was kind of inexperienced with and it was um it was it was magical i think we immediately liked each other and felt well more than that too i think we both loved these characters in a really similar way you know and that comes down to your writing scott you can't think about how the audience is going to perceive your character you don't know if they're going to think something bad might happen or you might be a worse guy than you really are you, you can't go there in the same way i think we just had to be present in these moments between beth and alma of the moments that were more transactional, the moments that were really building love, the moments that were like two skittish animals meeting each other for the first time. And there were, and just being present in all of those moments. What's amazing about that to me is that we shocked and enthralled people with kindness. Like that's, it's, they were amazed that people were good to each other and supported one another and allowed people to make mistakes. Like that's, I mean, not, I, I very much enjoy very violent shows or, you know, things that are very dark and gritty. I've made a lot of those movies, but it's, it's kind of amazing to be part of something that shows people being good to one another and to have so many people enjoy that. I remember I had ideas and then I would feed them to you guys and it would be, it would just transform into something magnificent. And Uli, do you remember when I gave you the book to read? Because we didn't have a script. And much like um, Anya and I think maybe even Bill, I, I, don't, I didn't have a script to give them. Do you remember when you read the book? Do you remember our first conversation and what you were thinking? I remember reading the, the, the novel and um, I was immediately attached to that. That was my first hook, really, beside the period and beside the madness of turning something complicated like chess into uh, into something visual and then talking to you guys talking to you scott and to, to bill uh, i was more more than happy to join in really and of course it was a, a you know the funny part of course was when bill called me for the first time saying you want to come uh, abroad and uh, try to shoot in europe maybe berlin maybe prague wherever um and then i read the novel and i thought but there's only a tiny bit in in paris and a tiny bit in moscow and, I, and who knows what the script would be like, but I, I, you know, I thought this is crazy. And then uh, I found out that we really could do it here. And that was a big challenge and a, and a, and a, and a super big joy to, to do that. And one thing that I love about the way you work is that it's all from character. Everything is, we have a conversation obviously early on about palette and looks and we reference certain things and so on. But every set, when you get down to the, the other decisions, the smaller decisions, they have uh, bigger ramifications because you're, it's another chance to tell a story on set. And your sets, all of us, you know, I think these three actors would tell you, you'd walk on the set and you would feel the story being told in every room you walked into. They weren't just sort of really interesting visually. There was, there was writing in the, in the decision. It was really amazing. And they were also beautiful. I mean, seriously, you know, you, you can only do so much and um, you can only be as good as the story. If that works and if, if, if it's clear what the whole thing is about, I mean, sometimes you start to work on something and kind of ask yourself, why again are we really doing this, right? 
And here was the clear opposite. It was so, it, the, the story and, and the motivation and the urge and everything was so clear um, that it kind of was almost easy to, to, to find myself, you know, into it or, or my, my way into it. Funny enough, the, the story is a road trip, right? In, in its own uh, way. Um, and that also kind of made it clear from or, or you know, understandable uh, how we how we want to structure this, how every city, every tournament is meant to be some some other kind of experience for Beth um, and really to build it up step by step and make it very different and bring in all these di different aspects uh, of, of her of her of her way finding her own place in this world kind of made it easy because there, there was always a reason and the decision or the, the communication and the discussions we had also saying that it's not it is necessarily this period and 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 and, and of course the place uh, in the US and, and in all these cities but first of all it's always supposed to be Beth's world or like a serious taken a fairy tale kind of world so and of course this gives you the freedom or the, the the potential freedom and and and, and dealing with you and Stephen, uh, the DOP, um, also considering or realizing that you really take that that promise serious. I mean, you also have a conversation very often in the beginning. Where everybody says, keeps saying, "Yeah, you can go wild. You can you know do whatever." And in the end, it never works. And you know, nobody has the courage or the fun or the humor to do that. And here it was. It was getting worse and worse, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a good way. And I just say, because I don't think I've really been on a panel with you, Uli, where I've been able to say, like, the moment I walked into my house, into Alma Uli's house, I learned so much about my character when I saw that house. It was like, oh, wow, this woman, talk about all of this repressed expression that she never got to get out anywhere and it's all coming out of the walls i mean and the sort of everything that she was lacking in her life i mean there was so much of this process both with the script and the costumes and the production design where as actors we were just getting these clues that were so rich like you know to have a script where one line tells you you know oh i had a child once you had Yes, and that's all you learn from the script. It's, it's it's all in one sentence. It's so distilled, it's so potent. And that was such a huge clue to me about who this woman was. But then walking into that house was this whole other clue because talk about wild. I mean, those all that wallpaper, but just to be like, from a character point of view, that just taught me so much about who she was and how to play her and what she really had inside. Cause she, I could look around and go, I picked all of this. I picked that, that wallpaper and I put it next to this wallpaper and I picked these curtains and like the whole thing. And it, it really is, it's a gift for an actor to have that much to play with. You know, for me, it's always, you need one center, you know, important uh, set, like the heart and soul of the story. And then, I mean, obviously the, the Wheatley house was potentially that, and um, so we spend the most time thinking about that and, and preparing that and researching for that. But um, also when I saw you coming on, on stage, you know, in your costume and being uh, Mrs. Wheatley, uh, I realized, oh, I guess we did, we did everything right. You know, that's, that's, Miss, that's the Miss Wheatley and that's her house. And uh, that all makes sense, you know. So it, it, it all just, you know, fell together in the, in the right way. And it was super... Of course, it was. It's very funny to do stuff like this and and a set like this where it's 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 beautiful at the one side. It, it's almost unbearable on the other side <laughs> because it's it's almost like a it's a, it's like a comic uh, reflection about the period and this kind of all American facade kind of you know dream uh, uh, to portrait in, in in this way. So yeah, it was just pure joy and 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 watching you guys you know, working in there and and being the people who own this house, it was just, you know, <laughs> well, I have the same feelings you had, Uli, of feeling like at some point Scott's going to tell me this is too much. Like the same way that you felt like some some point he's going to go, that's too far. Like when Beth, when I, you and I were doing 
Beth, when Annie and I were doing the scene, Beth and Alma scene where I'm vacuuming in my underwear and I <laughs> oh, yeah. it was like too over the top, but with that wallpaper and the vacuum and everything, <laughs> but somehow that plane worked and was so fun. Carlos, you and I have so much fun talking about the music and we start talking before I even write sometimes. And you'll send me music very early on and um, you will send me these little, what do we call them? These movies, these, these, it'll be this, the words from the script. Yeah, script movies, it's the words from the script scored. So the scene that's going by and then there's music going as I'm reading the stuff. And every time Carlos and I have worked together, I've gotten these ideas from the music in these things, particularly nonverbal scenes you know, there's a seven minute thing in Godless that came from that and a lot of stuff in Queen's Gambit that came from that. But it's wonderful to be able to start working early, you know, and part of that was before you became really in demand and didn't know any better, I could fully abuse you and put you on sooner than most composers. Now I worry that you've learned <laughs> and you'll basically start late and finish early like the other composers do. Um, uh, but, but that's a huge help. And like with Uli, the, the, for me, the sound is its, its own other, you know, thing. It's a huge thing. I mean, I, I mean, let's face it, we only get sight and sound to tell the story, but the music and the way you worked very closely with Wiley Statement and Tom Kramer. Wiley was our, you know, our, our main sound designer and his amazing team. And Tom Kramer was the music editor. We were constantly reshaping while we, uh, from very early on. And so what, I, we should talk about sort of how we discovered the music because we kind of went in a lot of different directions. Can you, want, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think I'm sticking with the word fairy tale. You started sending me a lot of music that you were listening to and thinking that would be helpful on the piano side. You really wanted a piano score. And that was sort of the center, and it is still the center, remained the centerpiece of the of the actual final score for the show. But it was that key word that I think created a yes in you when I when I sent you the music for the opening scene that was a little bit longer of the accident. And I remember thinking it feels it's starting to feel like a fairy tale. Like it's one of those old Disney stories like that the push in the camera pushes in on the book and the cover opens and then begins to start. That's what the music does sound like now. And it feel and that was sort of my way in for us to have a smooth ride. But in order to get there there was a lot of iterations and there was a lot of attempts and and more than anything the very big threat of making chess interesting through music you know and and or helping having music help it tell the story and and i really wasn't sure how to go about it and i think you do remember that the first games i got were in the basement with mr scheibel and it's so weird by the way being on this panel because there's three of you who I've, I feel like I know very well, but you have no idea who I am <laughs> because you do, and especially all of us in post, usually we spend so much time with footage and watching you act and uh, Bill Camp's breathing, uh, just it, it, a lot, he had this very heavy, and it kind of stayed with me. And I think it remained, Wiley kind of picked up on that, Wiley Statement, the sound designer. And it became a thing that we really try to focus in on Beth almost had at the beginning. But the one thing I do know is that Scott's idea was to make it piano. He wanted a pure piano score. And after I read the novel, uh, which is the first thing Scott sent to me, I knew I was going to be in trouble because it was um, very, very, uh, a lot A lot was mentioned by Walter Tevis about it being on um, classical music. He mentioned a lot of references of classical music throughout the actual novel. As a matter of fact, there's a scene where Beth gets left behind by her college friends you know, the, the morning after. And uh, in the actual novel, she listens to Vivaldi and she's listening to classical music. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so screwed. I don't know how I'm going to do this because it's going to be very complicated. And and somehow I do feel we found a way. And I think it has to do with the process Scott was talking about. Being able to make mistakes early on is everything for me because it is about the process. It is about trying to find your way in. And once you do, it feels like this freedom to kind of really start to play with things. And it's what made the ending of the show or, or the last episode feel like it came very came very easily and quickly. 
And but it wouldn't have been so had it not been for all the work of like almost two years. It's amazing. It's so beautiful. I listen to it all the time and people bring it up, you know, all the time. I think this is one of those things where the right molecules and atoms found each other <laughs> and coalesced. I don't know how it happened, but I feel that way. I feel very, very lucky that um, we all found each other. And I feel very lucky to have been able to do this and lucky that people like it the way they do. But mostly my feelings about all of you and when I, whenever I see you all, um, beyond any story that we told together, I feel, I feel incredibly close and really proud of all of you and grateful. So what a, what a thing. What a thing. <laughs> <laughs>